Maybe we can get started sort of slowly here while we're settling in. I'm going to move that just for now to avoid double microphone. Um, so yeah, if you haven't already done so, please add your responses to the poll questions that are up on the screen right now. You can see the URL for where to go to add your responses if you'd like to uh, on the chalkboard here. And um, yeah, we can just start by looking through how things went for, uh, for the last week and uh, some issues that, that have maybe come up. And uh, yeah, let's, let's get started there. Um, so yeah, what did you learn during week number two? Well, we saw maybe, let's, uh, can we see the, did people vote on this? Maybe that's where I have to have screen view to see the voting. Just check. Yeah, okay. So having a look just at the first question about what did you learn? Well, creating lists and sorting it, indexing and new methods and functions, creating lists and selecting index values. Those are all things that I hope would be uh, picked up in the first week. That's very good to see. Um, because that was essentially what we were covering as our main new thing were these Python lists and how to refer to values inside a list using um, index value, for example. Also good to be developing a bit of patience. Um, that's, especially as a new programmer, a skill that you will uh, perhaps need to lean on sometimes. And uh, that can be good and bad, but it's, uh, it's important to to persevere at least at the beginning when you're learning these things because it will be a little bit unfamiliar and it gets easier with time. Otherwise, there's a few things here about Git. So, um, you know, a variety of different things related to the kind of overall experience. So using GitHub, lists, markdown cells, cloning, saving, all that stuff. Um, and uh, how to add a picture to a markdown file. So hopefully in the exercise you were able to do that but uh, but this is yeah I would say fairly fairly good representation of how things uh, should look for for week number two um, let's have a look then at the question number two so I'll just switch the view here so we can see that one how's it going with git maybe make this a little bit bigger so I think just in looking at this quickly, uh, the relationship with Git is quite variable from person to person. So uh, some people are getting along and some people hate it. Um, so I would also say this is somewhat representative of a typical year in this course in that uh, learning to use Git, learning how to interact with GitHub can be a bit confusing and frustrating. And as a result, uh, the relationship can be quite um, difficult in some situations. At the same time, once you figure out how it works, it's actually fairly intuitive and, and, uh, and relatively easy to use. So once everything is functioning properly, uh, hopefully you'll find that it's a useful thing to know how to do, especially as we get into later exercises where you're, the code that you're writing is perhaps a little bit more complicated and there's more of a chance that you maybe break something in the code between commits and you realize that the reason for saving these uh, commits all along is the fact that, that you can go back and find something that was working before and uh, fix your code if you broke something. So um, yeah, I think there's a lot of kind of typical things in here. Important to read everything carefully. Small mistakes can cause errors. That's true. Uh, demanding but manageable, getting there. The issue here, my permanent token also stopped working during the week. Uh, I think this is something that we heard about a fair amount in Discord, and it's a problem that seems to be also occurring for, at least for myself, when I tested this. Um, this is an issue that I think is something that I don't have an immediate solution for. The token thing should work with caching your credentials, but um, I think maybe, in testing things, we, we didn't test it well enough because it doesn't seem to actually work for more than the session that you're currently active in. So that's a bit um, a bit disappointing, I would say. 
we can show, for example, that uh, when you enter your credentials for the first time, like when you, when you um, clone your exercise or something like that, uh, there is a little tick box there that you can check to say like temporarily store my credentials or login information or says something like that. That will cache your credentials for one hour. So at least you're not asked to put them in uh, for an hour, but we're working to see if we can find a solution that would at least allow you to only have to put in your credentials once per session. So whenever you create one of these um, notebook sessions and open up the CSC notebooks, you'd put your credentials in once and, uh, and things might work more smoothly like that, but um, that's a work in progress and we'll see if we can find a, a good solution. I would say keep an eye on Discord and we'll, if we find a solution, we can post something there that would hopefully be a bit better than the current situation. But uh, yeah, I think in the worst case at the moment, maybe just tick the box when you put in your credentials to say to cache them for an hour and at least then you only have to put them in once per hour. Um, this is one of the tricky things about working in a cloud computing environment because normally this would be an easier process to do. But, uh, but in a cloud computing environment, basically everything in your home directory gets deleted every time you, your instance uh, is destroyed or created. And so that means that um, we lose places where these kind of cached credentials would normally be stored. Otherwise, um, looks like Git stuff is, yeah, sort of working. It'll get more familiar as we go on. So don't, don't panic too much about that. Uh, otherwise, questions about the pair programming. Let's have a look here. So, um, how can I share my exercise repository with my pair? That's a good question. I think if you go into the, uh, let's have a look here. So let me go to my GeoPython. Uh, I'll go to my exercise number two, which I may or may not have created a copy of. So I'll go to my exercise number one. So in here, if you want to share, oops, um, did I just close that? No, it's here. Uh, if you want to share your exercise with your programming partner, uh, of course, by default, the exercise permissions are private, which means only the instructors and yourself can get your uh, access to your repository. But if you go into settings in your exercise repository, uh, I think you can then go to collaborators and teams and inside here, you can manage access and you could, for instance, add your partner by their GitHub username. So uh, in principle, I guess this means that I should be able to add Come here like this. And then you can set what kind of permissions your programming partner would have uh, to your repository. I would maybe recommend just setting it to read access if you are the driver for that week. But of course, you can discuss with your partner if you want to do something else. But uh, you know, in principle, the driver is the one who should be making the changes to the code. So maybe read access is, uh, is sufficient. Um, at least for me right now, I can only add Kamyar with admin access. Uh, I don't know exactly why that is. But once you add someone, then um, it should be the case that, uh, okay, because he's an owner of the organization, I can't give him lower permissions. But, uh, but basically then your partner would be able to see your uh, exercise repository as well. So, yeah, that's, that's a um, nice thing to be able to do just so that you can both look at the modified version of the code, especially if you can't get everything finished in one session, then you can go back and, uh, and look at it. Um, partner doesn't respond to any of my messages. If that's the case, please let us know. Uh, maybe either come down when we take the break or send a message in Discord because there are some partners who may or may not be active in the course, or maybe they were active the first week and then they've disappeared. And if your partner's not responding to any of your messages, we can reassign you with another partner. So um, don't panic about that. We can solve that problem. Um, and there's some questions here about, is it possible to work independently? Our preference for the first 
like exercises two through four is to pair you up. After that, then we usually are a little bit more negotiable about working independently. But there are, of course, some instances where people have like a work schedule that makes it difficult for them to find a time to meet with their partner. Uh, if you're interested in working independently, I again would suggest you come and talk to myself or Kamyar individually and we can, um, we can discuss the situation. Um, mm -mm. Yeah, so I mean, it can be a bit tricky in, uh, in practice sometimes to get the partners to, to work out. Uh, I think it's great when it does work because it is actually a quite effective way, especially when you're learning to program, but I do understand logistically it can be a bit challenging. So, um, yes. I think that kind of covers the majority of the feedback here. Hard to communicate if one wants to join online. Yeah, I mean, the best situation there is to maybe to have the driver share their screen on Zoom or something like that. So at least you're both looking at the same screen at the same time and you can be talking to one another. But um, it is also something that's nicer to do in person if, if possible. It makes the communication a bit easier, I would say. Uh, just like Zoom teaching or anything like that, uh, it's always a bit more difficult to do things online. But uh, yeah, I think this looks pretty pretty much reflects what we see year to year in this, that uh, the pair programming, once you get into it, I think it's quite helpful, but I do know that uh, it's easier to work alone sometimes. Uh, I think probably all of us have that feeling, but there's a reason why we try to push you to do this for the first few weeks. And then after that, um, again, we can be more open to uh, letting you work alone if you're really wanting to do that. Uh, one thing I would say, is that with these programming partner issues we've been seeing, uh, we were thinking that we would extend the deadline for the exercise number two to like noon on Wednesday. So give you a little bit of extra time. We've had several messages from people whose partners haven't been able to meet. Um, and we don't want to extend the deadline too much because then it starts to interfere with the exercise number three, but um, we'll extend the deadline and we'll post this in Discord maybe as well. Uh, for exercise number two to uh, 12 o'clock noon on Wednesday this week. So at least you get a little bit of extra time that way. Uh, I know at least some of the partners were saying they were going to meet up early this week. And um, hopefully that's, uh, that's somewhat helpful. Any other questions or comments about anything that, uh, that wasn't discussed? Yeah. Yeah, so about the grades for the previous exercises, um, that's a good question. I think normally what will happen, I'll show you an example maybe from, uh, from last year. This is going to be a bit tricky to see, but I wonder if I can I'll have to see which exercise I actually did this in um, to show you what the normal feedback would look like. So uh, this is an example. So this is my exercise number two from last year. We have this automated grading thing that we'll go through and basically for all the code cells, it will try to grade them first. And then one of the course assistants will review it to make sure that like the grader bot thing didn't make any mistakes. Um, but what happens is you'll know that your exercise has been graded by the, the bot thing when you get a message like this um, in your exercise repository. Uh, and if you look at this readme file, the one that kind of describes what to do in the exercise, down at the bottom, there will be this extra stuff here about the grade and feedback. So we haven't obviously run this yet for exercise number two. That's the first one where we will actually grade the exercise using the grader bot. Uh, for the first week's exercise, essentially, if you put your post into uh, Discord with your GitHub username and stuff like that. We just give like a kind of, it's like a pass fail thing. Like if you did that, you get all the points. If not, like we don't kind of grade that uh, in, in more detail. It's basically, did you do the exercise or not? For the other ones, we will grade with uh, looking at the points here. And so I didn't do anything in this exercise before I graded it. Uh, so I got zero points out of 10. Um, 
because there was nothing in any of the code cells, so it failed all the tests and it gave me zero points, which is an expected outcome. But uh, what you'll see is that once we've run the grader bot, and part of the reason why we want to uh, have this deadline of 12 o'clock on Wednesday is we'd like to run the grader in the afternoon on Wednesday uh, for, for exercise number two. You'll see this, and uh, normally when we run this, we send a message to the course assistant saying that the exercise has been graded, and then they start going through and maybe takes them a day or two to go through the exercises and uh, review them. Where it says here that the grader is the grader bot, it says awaiting review by a course grader. Whoever your course assistant is will delete this and put their name there, and then you kind of know that that's the final version of the exercise grading. And you should see a breakdown of the points here, and normally uh, we've asked them also to add a little bit of feedback just to say like what went well, or if there was a, something you could fix to just put a quick post there. So um, that would be the easiest place to see the grades when they're, um, once they exist. But uh, if you have any questions, if you don't see feedback and you're like, I you know, turned in my exercise two weeks ago, what's going on? Uh, you can always post in Discord. And uh, I would contact maybe the course assistant who is responsible for your exercise first, just because sometimes if they just haven't had a chance to do it, that's, uh, that's the easiest point of contact. But, but yeah, good question. So um, are there other questions? OK. So I don't see anything. Um, key takeaway messages are that you have extra time to finish exercise number two until 12 o'clock on Wednesday. And uh, the Git credential issue is a work in progress if we come up with a clever solution. Uh, we'll post it in Discord, and we can also show it at the beginning of class next time or have the course assistants demonstrate uh, in the help sessions on Thursday and, uh, and Friday. I think there is a solution that exists, but I don't know how kind of easy it will be to get it working properly. So we'll see. All uh, right, so let's turn ourselves then to the course page for a moment here. So have a look at what we're up to this week in uh, lesson number three. So uh, if you look at the lesson overview, you see we have basically two tasks or two new Python programming concepts that we're learning today uh, that both fall under the category of what's called control flow, which is essentially deciding what parts of your code get executed uh, when you run a program. So the two things that we're going to learn, one is how to use a loop, which allows you to repeat a part of a code um, a fixed or, well, a given number of times. And, uh, and then conditional statements, which are essentially just decision-making things like, if this is true, do this part of the code. If not, do something else. Um, so we'll see how to use both these loops and conditional statements in this week's lesson. And of course, you'll naturally be able to do the same thing in the exercise as, uh, as well. And to get started, I think uh, we should go here to the CSC Notebooks. If you haven't done that already, I'm going to log in because I haven't done that. And uh, maybe I'll have to try this again. Let's see if it wants to work. There we go. So I'll just log in as me. And I had a session already open. And I guess I'll just go with that since it's already open. But uh, you know, I realize you're going to launch your session. It might take a moment. So um, yeah, we'll get started here a bit slowly. So as a reminder, the important thing to do in each one of the lessons when we get started is to go into your My Work folder, go into the Notebooks directory, and then go over to the Git plugin and pull the latest changes. So you should see whenever you go here that it'll pop up, usually showing that there have been some changes uh, to your local file. So like when you work on the exercise, it will notice that, hey, these files aren't the same as what I had originally. But uh, you can kind of ignore that. The main thing you want to do here is just click the button up at the top to pull the latest changes. You would not be able to push anything. So uh, it doesn't matter if you click push, it'll, it, it won't allow you to do it. But if you click pull the latest changes, what you should see is that when you go back 
to the file browser, you now have an L3 folder with your notebooks for this week's lesson. If you have any trouble with that, getting the notebooks for this week's lesson, just uh, maybe raise your hand and then Kamya could perhaps uh, help you out. So at least you got one person back. But uh, yeah, just as a reminder, when you first connect and your session finally comes up, you go to my work, notebooks, then go to the Git plugin and pull the latest changes. Um, we still haven't figured out a good way to automate this process. It used to work in the past, but it doesn't. Uh, there's not an easy way to do this in the CSD Notebooks platform at the moment. But once you've got the latest things there, you can go into the L3 folder, and we're going to start with the for loops um, notebook. So you can just double click on that one to open that up. And uh, I'm just going to make the file browser smaller so it's out of the way. But uh, yeah, if you're having problems, again, just like somehow make it visible and we'll try to, to help you out. Okay, so let's start with the kind of concept here of why we would even want to learn how to do something like a, a for loop. And we can do that by using some, uh, some cities in Europe that are in a Python list. So hopefully this looks familiar that you've got these square brackets to indicate we have a list and some comma separated values inside there. You can just run this cell, and uh, then that will store the uh, values in the list. And if we wanted to see, for instance, the first city in our list, we could go to index zero of the European cities list and just run the cell. And uh, what you see is Helsinki, or what you should see, hopefully, is, is Helsinki. And uh, if I copy this and just paste it into the cell beneath it, and we could look at the second city in the list by changing the index value to one, the third city in the list by changing it to two, and of course, the fourth city by changing it to three. We could go through and it can access the individual values using the index, just going dunk, 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 um, and getting each one of the cities that way. That's fine. We know how to do that. We knew how to do that last week. Um, and you know, it's perhaps just a good reminder that this is the way in which we define a list and how we access the values in the list using uh, an index value. But this isn't a very good way to do this uh, for a couple reasons. Of course, if you want to access these values individually, uh, this isn't going to scale very nicely for long lists. So if you have to repeat this process 200 times to get each one of the values by hand, of course, that's going to be tedious and you're going to make mistakes and probably um, you know, get annoyed with programming and quit doing it all together. Uh, but also, it doesn't work if you have fewer than four cities, or in fact, more than four cities uh, as well. This doesn't work. So if we change our list of European cities to now, instead of having four, have three, so Riga, Rome, and Athens, and we do the same thing we did before. So we take our European cities, Example like this, go to the first index, fine. Now we get Riga because we've redefined the list. It has the same name it had before, but we've changed the, the contents of the list. But if we do the same exact process we had, so for instance, if we were just to copy paste what we had above and go through with these different index values, okay, fine, Rome, Athens, of course, you run into a problem when you get to the fourth one because we're expecting our list to have four cities in it. There's only three, and so you get an index error where you try to access the fourth item in this list that only has three items. So that index error, as a reminder, is kind of a dead giveaway that you're trying to do something outside of the list of values that you have available. So this, even though uh, we have a short list here, this still is problematic to approach the problem doing things this way. So what's a better way to do this? Well, this is the reason for introducing the idea of a for loop. So let's change the list of cities once more. Just can run the cell here to update our list of cities now to have Amsterdam, Brussels, Lisbon, and Reykjavik. If we wanted to just print out each one of these cities, we can do this much more easily using a for loop. 
So this starts with the, uh, the keyword for, or the statement for, and we can then say for city in European cities, and then colon. And if you hit enter, what you should see is that the text now is going to be indented underneath this for statement. We're just going to do print city. So we'll keep it simple for right now. So we have for city in European cities, which is our list of cities above, print city. If you run this cell, what you see now is that the four cities get printed out one by one. So what this is doing is basically going through this list and iterating over each of the values in the list. And each time it takes the value here, assigns it to this variable called city, and then we can do something with that variable value that's been assigned, like print it out to the screen. What's nice about this is that now, if we had 100,000 cities in our list, or if we had two, it doesn't make any difference. The same code will print out every single one of the items in the list. So if we copy this, just for the sake of, uh, of simplicity, we could first run this US cities example here. So a few cities from the US. And if I just paste the code down here, I'll make one little change. Instead of European cities, we'll say US cities. But now for city in US cities, print city. Now we have what, eight? And you run the code and it prints out all eight, no problem. So we changed the name of the list from European cities to US cities, but it doesn't matter. This is flexible. Whatever number of values you have in your list, it's gonna be able to print them out and iterate over them, no problem. Of course, this is a much better approach to this uh, kind of dealing with lists and individual values in lists problem than, uh, than to do this by kind of printing them out one by one. Yeah, question? I was wondering, why do you have to do uh, write city in sentence? Okay, so why do we have to put this city here? Yeah, so um, this is a good question. Basically what happens is with the way that this for statement works is it will expect whatever you list here last to be some kind of collection. We, the only collection we really know about right now is a Python list, so we have our list of values here. When it goes through and assigns a value or uses the values one by one, it has to have some variable name where it can store the individual value as it's going through them one by one. So in this case, that variable is called city, and what happens basically inside Python is that it goes to the first index in the list, and it says its value is equal to the variable or assigned to the variable city. And then after that, whatever we do in here, we can use that value city however we like. So um, I think maybe it'll make a little bit more sense in the kind of explanation that follows underneath here. But basically, this is just a way for us to be able to store a value from the list to be able to do something with, within the for loop. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could call it like, you know, it, it would be confusing, but you could like call it, you know, for, um, I don't know, for animal in U.S. cities, print animal. Uh, oops. That works exactly the same. It's just a variable. So it's just a matter of like, of course, choosing something that makes sense. In this case, you wouldn't take a list of cities and assign it to a variable called animal because that would naturally be quite confusing, but it's, it's just a normal variable. So anything, um, you know, in this case, I think this is a sort of logical choice, but uh, to call it city. Thank you. Yes, good question. Thank you for asking. Um, but yeah, the for loop format looks like this. So we have the overall kind of structure when you use a for loop is it, of course, it starts with the keyword for or the, the for statement. Then it expects the next thing that comes to be some variable. So as we just saw, that variable could be something like city or animal. Any word that is a sort of uh, valid variable name can be used there. Uh, of course, there are these reserved keywords like you couldn't say for, um, for if in collection or for, um, well, let's just take a look at the list of reserved keywords. 
these are the ones you can't use. So you couldn't say for, let's see, what have we seen? We've seen del. Remember, del was how we were deleting values out of a list last week. So you couldn't say for del in whatever the list name is because those are kind of protected words that are meant to do specific things in Python. So you can't assign a variable value to them. Um, did we see any other ones? I guess we've seen import. And uh, I guess that's most of what we've seen. But you know, if we tried to do, for instance, up here for import in US cities, print import. What you're going to see first off is that already this import word is recognized inside JupyterLab as something special. It shows up in green, whereas usually variables would show up in black. And if I try to run this, it tells me invalid syntax because essentially it says you're not allowed to use import as a variable name. Uh, same thing would go if we put in del here. It gets the same invalid syntax error. Uh, it's basically saying like, hey, this, is, this does something special. It's not allowed to be used. Uh, as a variable name. If you made it delete, you could then, you know, print delete. That's not a problem because delete is not a protected keyword. Del is protected, so you can't use that one. Uh, again, this wouldn't make any sense to do it this way, but just to, to demonstrate the idea. So this is just a normal variable. Uh, oops, uh, I shouldn't double click on there. Starts with a four, ends with a colon character. So that's important as well. If you don't include that, you'll get a some kind of uh, error message, maybe something about the invalid uh, syntax. Let's go back here and test it out. So if we leave the colon off of here, yeah, here comes the syntax error. And the nice thing is that Python at least tells you what it thinks is wrong. It says, I expected to see this colon character and it's not there. I can tell you're using a four, statement. So there should be a colon at the end of the line. It's missing. And that's why there's a syntax error. And you put that back and everything is okay. So it starts with four, ends with a colon. Code that should be executed beneath or within this for statement, whatever you want to do, however many times you kind of go through here doing things, has to be indented beneath the for statement. So you notice like when we defined this the first time, when we made this list, I think with the one we did for European cities, as soon as you hit the colon character and hit enter, it automatically indents you uh, four spaces over. So this indentation here is what I'm referring to uh, in that case. Everything that you want to have executed within this for loop has to be indented. And uh, if you don't indent it, again, we can demonstrate this, you'll get an indentation error, which basically says, Okay, you gave a for statement and then you didn't indent anything under, underneath it. So um, this is an issue as in it expects there to be some indentation. Now you can indent by less than four spaces. It's possible to indent by even one space. Um, you'll see that this shows up in red because it's not really the recommended way to do things in Python. The recommendation is that uh, you would indent by four spaces. So you'll notice that when you go four spaces over, um, the red print turns into green print. Um, and that's just uh, because of the standard in Python is four spaces and indentation. But it will work if you have less or more than that. But I would just say uh, stick to four spaces because that's, that's what's expected. So yeah, indentation, typically four spaces, and uh, there's no need to have anything at the end of the for statement to indicate that the for loop has ended. So there's no kind of end for or end or anything like that. Uh, you simply go back to not indented stuff. So um, let's say here, if I added a print statement that's not indented underneath this for loop, What's going to happen is the for loop will be executed first. It's going to go through each one of the cities and print them. And this print hello will only happen once. So you can see all eight of the cities and then hello is beneath that. If I indent this, things change now because 
when it's indented, it's included as part of that for loop. So it's going to print a city and then hello, and then the next city and hello, and go through like that. So now we can see we get different output here because this hello has been indented. So Python sees that as part of the same for loop. It's going to go through and say, okay, every time I print a city, I'm now going to print hello as well. But, uh, but in order to indicate the end of what you want to do inside a for loop, you just basically go back to the normal um, indentation. So in this case, no indentation uh, would allow us to then proceed with doing other things in the code, such as printing the word hello. Now, for some kind of analogy for how things work, you can pretty much think about a for loop as somewhat similar to how things work in your daily life. So whether you're a cat that is kind of going crazy at various times of the day and otherwise pretty much sleeping, um, you know, that, that might be the cat's kind of daily for loop that it goes through doing these same things. But, uh, but for us, for instance, at least during the weekdays, most people have somewhat of a, a routine that uh, hopefully you wake up. Um, maybe you take a shower, maybe eat breakfast, maybe brush your teeth, and then whatever. But for each day in the week, you kind of go through this routine of doing certain things um, over and over. And that's kind of what a for loop is about. It's about repeating the same things over and over. And in code, a lot of times, like if you read in data from a data file, maybe you want to process each one of the lines you read in to do some kind of calculation. Um, you know, if you're reading in, I don't know, temperature data, maybe you want to calculate the average temperature for all the temperatures you read in uh, in one line, for example. But it, the idea is basically just like for doing things that happen repeatedly, uh, rather than copy pasting all these commands like, you know, print out this city, then print that city, then print that city, you use a for loop to go through and just do the same thing to each one of the lines. It reduces the amount of code you write, which means it also likely reduces the number of places you can make a mistake. Because you could imagine already, if we scroll back up to our example here, of these eight cities, if we had print statements for each one of the cities individually, there's just more chance that you're going to have a, a mistake in what you're printing. And so the for loop is a much safer thing to do because if it works uh, basically for one city, in principle, it should work for all of them in this Python list. But yeah, the basic idea for a for loop is you can think about that like the kind of daily routine. Now, as mentioned, uh, these variables that we use in for loops are, they're pretty much just normal, uh, normal Python variables. So if we had, for instance, instead of uh, what we had before with these cities, some list of, of weather conditions, and then we wanted to do, again, just print them out to the screen, uh, we have our for loop, so starting with four, um, so let's say for weather in weather conditions, colon. And uh, just to make things a little bit more interesting, I'll just make a, an F string here and say today's weather is, and uh, then we'll put in weather. You don't have to put that. You can just print the weather variable if you want. Um, also note that I use double quotes here and I used a single quotation mark for my uh, possessive todays. Uh, if you use single quotes here, you're going to have problems that Python won't be happy. Uh, I'll show you that in just a second. But if we run this, what we see is today's weather is rain, sleet, snow, freezing fog, sunny, cloudy, and ice pellets. Uh, I used to work in Canada, and this was kind of representative of the weather conditions in Canada. Uh, probably equally applicable here in a couple months, but um, but yeah, I liked particularly that ice pellets was a regular Canadian uh, weather forecast or condition. Um, but the thing is, if we then just printed out weather after doing all this, what you see is that ice pellets is the thing that's left in the variable weather. So this variable that's used in the for loop it's just a normal variable and it's going through and it's just getting assigned a value from the list each time it goes through the loop. And after you're done, that value still exists in memory in Python, so it could still be used. 
the reason I want to point that out is that this can be a little bit dangerous sometimes. So depending if you have multiple for loops, you can still have values kind of hanging around that were defined earlier in your notebook, for instance, um, that are usable. And so you don't get a kind of name error or something that indicates that the, the variable hasn't been defined. And uh, if you've you know, reused the same variable name, sometimes your code can do things that are a little bit unexpected. So just pay attention when you use these for loops that this is a regular variable, so it will still be around after you've run the loop. Um, but yeah, so whatever, just printed out these different conditions and our weather value is still sticking around afterwards. I mentioned the thing about the quotation marks. Um, if I used single quotes here, which single quotation marks are totally fine to use in Python for indicating an F string, for example, uh, you'll notice that then what you see as the F string is basically just this because it sees a single quotation mark and another one that looks like it's the end of my string uh, when I have this uh, apostrophe for uh, today's. And if I run this, then I get an issue that it's um, trying to figure out what's going on with this extra quotation mark here that doesn't seem to be doing anything. So again, just pay attention. Sometimes it's like easy to put something into a string of text and not remember that, oh, there's a quotation mark inside my string, uh, which is why my code is not working. Um, typically, people don't put like quotation marks with double quotes, like you know, some, some text from a book or something like that wouldn't normally be in a print statement in Python. I guess it could be, uh, but just the point is to pay attention that like these quotation marks, the double quotes, uh, can play nicely with a single quote, but you have to have double quotes on either end and anything in the middle um, should have single quotation marks or vice versa. Um, but you wouldn't put a double quotation mark here in normal English grammar. Like you wouldn't use double quotation marks for possessive. So anyway, uh, I just mentioned that just because like we've seen this issue before that sometimes people get confused because you get a rather, as you saw, uh, somewhat weird syntax error, unterminated string literal detected at line two, which uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to most people in terms of uh, understanding what the actual problem is here. So just a note. Okay, a couple other things about for loops. Um, so we've seen now how to go through and use the individual values from the loop, assign them to a variable, print them out to the screen, for example. But there is another function we can use uh, for doing things where we maybe want to use the index value to refer to the items in the list rather than the uh, list values themselves. So um, if we, for instance, uh, were to make a new for loop here that says for value in range, five. So range is the function that will give us a list of integer values that is however many numbers long in the list. So in this case, it's going to be uh, five numbers long. So it's essentially giving us a list of zero, one, two, three, four. Uh, and if we print out our value, when we run this, we get zero, one, two, three, four printed to the screen. So this range function, it doesn't exactly return a Python list, but it returns something very similar to a Python list, such that it is another kind of collection. And in this case, the collection of values goes from zero to four. And so when we go through in our for loop, the uh, number that we get for value each time will be one of those values from the range function. Now, what's nice about this is that you can do it so that the numbers are in 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 order. You can start at a different number. You can skip values in between there. And if you want to know more about how to use it, you can use the built-in help in Python by typing help parentheses and then the name of something you want to learn about, like for this case, the function called range. When you run this, you get back the documentation that explains how the range function works. Um, so it returns an object that produces a sequence of integers from start to stop by step. Now that might take a moment to unpack what that means. Start inclusive, stop exclusive uh, probably is a little bit 
um, unclear to you. But basically, whatever number you say, like we gave a single value uh, because you don't have to give any more values than uh, one with the range function. But if you wanted to do something more sophisticated, you can live, you can give the number that you want to start with. So like if you wanted to start with one instead of zero, you could put one and then comma the value you want to stop with. But the exclusive part of this means it goes up to, but does not include that value when producing the list of numbers. You'll get a chance to explore this in just a second. And then you can specify also a step in there, which means how many value, like do you want to go every second value, every fifth value, uh, etc. So it allows you to kind of skip over if you wanted to go by fives, for instance, like, you know, 1, 6, 11, 16, whatever. Um, you could do it that way. Um, and this then describes a little bit how this range function works. Which brings us here to an opportunity for you to do test out your understanding of the range function. So uh, I think uh, if we go to the Presimo, I'll turn off the earlier questions unless, uh, let's see, make our question visible on the screen. So the question here, I'll just go back to the notebook for a second, is using the documentation from the help range command. Uh, what you want to do here is imagine that you replaced what's in the dot 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 here with some values. And what you want to see is that when you run this, so for i in range, blah, 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 print i, you want to see the output 2, 5, 8. So the question for you is what would you put into this place when using the range function to get the output 2, 5, 8? And you can go, uh, I've got to make this a little bit smaller now to be able to see it. But you can go here and have a look at the poll question to see what you would put in and uh, click on one of the options here to vote for your choice for what you would put in to get 258 as the output. And uh, we'll continue in just a moment. As a reminder, the goal is to get the output 258 printed to the screen when you have a for loop that goes through using this range function. And uh, let's have a quick look at what the responses are so far. So we've got two choices that seem to be being debated at the moment. So one of them is to have 283, the other is to have 293. And so why don't we think now a little bit about what this means and have a look at what we were tasked with doing. So remember that with the range function, one of the things that's unfortunately a little bit um, perhaps counterintuitive about it is that when you use it, yes, indeed, you can start with a number two. So that was the correct place to start with getting the output that we want. But when you define the stop value, it will go up to but not include that value in the the values that are generated by the range function. So if you put in, for instance, eight here, if you said two, eight, and then yes, it does in see, indeed seem like the step was defined properly as three, because you saw that we had two, five, eight, and that means that you're going up by three between the values. Well, what you would see in that case would be, you would get two and five, but you wouldn't get the eight printed because that value is not included in what the range function defines in the list. So for instance here, if we said for i in range two, and I think we said we were gonna go up to eight, for example, and three, print i, what you get here is only two and five because the range items will go up to but not include eight, the stop value. In order to get eight included in the output here, it needs to go to nine, three, which is somewhat counterintuitive why things work that way, but, um, but that is often the way that things are working with these kind of range definitions in Python, that you include the start value, but you go up to, but don't include the end value. With the range function, the way that I've at least been able to make sense to it in my head is that the default behavior, if we just said like, let's print out five values, 
is that you get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So you get five values here, but you'll notice the number 5 is not included in that list of values because the indexing is starting at 0. And I think this sort of behavior is somewhat similar when we do things with the example that we had here. So the correct answer in this case was 293. And of course, that seems to be the majority of what people voted for. So that's good. Uh, in principle, you could also do 2103, and that works just as well. Um, and I think 2113 would also work because what's happening is you're going up by 3. So when you start at 2, the next one is 5, and then 8. And then here you go up to 11, but remember that 11 is not included, so you wouldn't get that displayed until you go to 2, 12, 3. So um, anyway, just a little demonstration of how the range function works, and we'll see a little bit more of how to use that, uh, well, basically now. But are there any questions about that range function at this point? We don't use it a ton, but it's, it's good to know about. Okay. So we have a couple things uh, left here, and then we'll take, a, take our break. So yeah, looping over the length of a list. So um, we've seen that you can use the range function to print something out to the screen a certain number of times. But here, we have a list of uh, now African cities. And so if we run this, we can store our list. And if we wanted to, we can also use the range function to go over this list of cities and print them out to the screen. So again, we start with four, and we can say for city. But instead of saying for city in African cities or European cities or whatever like we did before, we can now say for city in range. And we know that if we want to know how many items are in this list, we can use this function called len. We saw that last week. So we could say, for city in range, len African cities. And then there's two closed parentheses here because we have, just to make it more visible, this is going to give us the length of our list. The range function is going to give us a list of numbers that's as long as the length of our list. Uh, so I'm just put the spaces there just to make it easier to see. Then we could print. But instead of printing city, and actually maybe I'm going to change this instead of being for city in range to be for i in range to be a little bit more obvious uh, for what we're doing here. Uh, we can print African cities with the index i. So remember that the range function is going to give us a list of integer values, whole numbers. It's going to start at zero and go up to however long this length of the uh, list of cities is. Each time through the for loop, that number is going to get assigned to a variable called i, and we're going to then use that i to refer to an index location in our Python list. So if we run this, we now see our six African cities printed out to the screen, pretty much like we saw before, but of course we've taken a different approach in doing things this way. So of course you can see that we're now using the range function and uh, we're assigning the values to a variable called i. Um, just as a note, this, like when you assign values to uh, use as an index, i is a very common variable name to use for that. You'll see this in Python, but also many other programming languages. There'll be something where a loop has i as the value that's assigned to use to go through the values using the index. But um, Instead of printing out city like we did before, now we have to print out the name of the list and then put the square brackets to use the index value to get that single city out of our list of cities. So that's how it works if you want to use this range function. And maybe at this point you're going like, it was easier to do it the other way. Why would we want to bother with doing things this way? Like, why, would I even, why wouldn't I just say for city in African cities, print city? That's shorter easier, less confusing. Good question. And that's also addressed here in, uh, in the lesson. And there's multiple reasons why you might want to do things this way, but a common case would be something like this. So here we have two lists. 
a list of cities and a list of countries. And you'll notice that each one of the cities has the corresponding country where it is the capital city. So this is all the Nordic capital uh, cities. If we want to use one for loop to go through and print out the information we have in these two lists, what we want to do is we want to make sure that if we take one city from our cities list, we get the corresponding country in our countries list. And we can do that basically using the same approach we just saw above. So for I in range, len, and we'll just say cities. So that's the, the list we're working with. We can then have a print statement and let's do a nice F string for this one to make it so we get some nice looking output. And we could say, for instance, in the curly brackets, cities at index I is the capital of, and we can then put countries at index I. So again, with our F string, we're putting things inside the curly braces to refer to a variable value. And here we have our cities, and we're using the index to then refer to which one of the cities in our list, and the value for the index is coming from this range function. And the same thing happens for the countries. By using that same variable i, we then make sure that when we refer to the first city, we refer to the first country. Second city, second country, third city, you get the kind of idea here, right? And when you run this, you get Helsinki is the capital of Finland, Stockholm is the capital of Sweden, etc. So this is one example of where you would maybe want to use the index value instead of the value in the list itself, because this is actually a lot harder to do if you wanted to do this without using the index. Remember that if we were just to go through and say for city in cities, the value we would have there would just be Helsinki. There's no way to actually link that value without doing something kind of clumsy to, uh, to countries. We could use the index method for a Python list and say which index is Helsinki located in this list of cities and then take countries at that same index. But that's a bit convoluted uh, and it's, it's perhaps easier to do things this way. So you'll see that there are cases where, um, where you may want to do this. There are some Python built-in functions to help with this when you have a pair of lists that have, have kind of corresponding values in them because that's quite common. Um, there's things like enumerate that can help with this and zip, but, um, but those are a little bit confusing, uh, even, even maybe more confusing than this for people who are new programmers. So we try to not introduce those just yet, but um, there are other ways to solve this problem as well. All right, so then let's check our understanding one more time and take our break. So uh, here we have two lists of numbers, odd numbers and even numbers. We've got a for loop and uh, then we've got a print statement here. And the question for you is what would be the output from running this code? Please don't just copy paste it into the cell below, but think about it first and, uh, and then vote on your, uh, your preferred answer. Um, <laughs> Let's make this question visible. And so you should be able to go here to the voting, to the poll page, and put in your response. Again, the question here is that when you do this for loop with this odd numbers and even numbers, what is the output that you would expect to see? And uh, why don't we do it that we'll, you can answer the question now or uh, within the next 15 minutes, but let's take a 15 minute break and then we'll continue after that. So at uh, 1035, we'll continue.